Uh, we'll be continuing our study in the book of Mark after having uh, Fyodor with us last week. So if you want to go ahead and start flipping to Mark chapter 9, we'll pick up in verse 30 and unpack some things there. But as you're flipping there, I want you to think about something for me. I want to think about if you know this person or maybe if you are this person. The person who doesn't watch a single movie in a long series, like think about all the Marvel movies, okay? Let's say you've watched none of them, but Avengers Endgame Part 2 comes out and the whole world seems to be going crazy about it, so you decide to go or your friend decides to go. And maybe you're the person who this friend comes along with and the whole time you're trying to enjoy this movie, right? You've spent years investing hours watching all of these movies to watch it all come to this climactic finish only to at every spot in the movie where the music changes or there's a hone in on this one character, the person next to you who has no idea what's going on continues to ask you, hey, what does that mean? What is going on? And you're like, if you were to watch the other seven movies, you would understand by now what is happening. Right? And it's because they missed all the buildup. It's because they missed all the backstories that went into this climactic movie that they did not fully understand or comprehend what was going on. And do we not see the disciples in that boat so often as we look throughout the New Testament, in particular as we've been studying the Gospel of Mark? They've been with Jesus. They've seen him do healings. They've heard him teach. They've seen him interact with the Pharisees and the religious elite. And they've heard him, even three of them got to see him on top of the Mount Transfiguration. And yet they still have trouble understanding what it means to be a true follower of Christ. And is that not where a lot of us are today? That we miss the point of what scripture says we are to be as believers. That either we come with our own preconceived notions of what that means. Or we let the Christian culture around us influence us. And we miss the call to biblical discipleship. Well this morning as we continue in Mark 9. I hope that we understand the Jesus request of his disciples. Not just here in Mark 9. But also for you and I today as we still proclaim to follow him and to love him and to look more like him each and every day. So starting in the book of Mark chapter 9 starting in verse 30 it says this from there they went out and they were going through Galilee and he was not wanting anyone to know about it for he was teaching his disciples and telling them the son of man is to be delivered into the hands of men and they will kill him and when he has been killed he will rise again three days later. But they did not understand this statement, and they were afraid to ask him. Now, let's pause right here, unpack this, and we'll keep on going. The first thing I think Jesus asked for his disciples to understand is that they need to understand Jesus' fate. They need to understand what is going to happen to this Jesus that they've been following, this Savior, this Messiah, as Peter has already proclaimed previously he understands what his role is but again as Vlad unpacked a couple weeks ago the Jewish concept of the Messiah was not this person who would come to save the world from sins it was of this religious uh, or political leader who would free Israel from the power of Rome that was their conception that's what they were understanding it would be this powerful, militant guy who would come in, who would take the world by storm, and he would just completely take over and rule. So again, picture that. That's what you're expecting is this political leader, this militant leader to come in, and Jesus has said, hey, I'm the Messiah. And what does he say? The Son of Man himself is to be delivered into the hands of men, and they will kill him. And when he has been killed, he will rise again three times days later. Now that does not sound like the proclamation you would want this political military leader to make as he just got on the scene. That doesn't make sense. And so that's why you see the disciples' response here as they said, but they did not understand this statement. And the fact of the matter is this is not the first time that Jesus had made this statement. Back earlier, a couple chapters, I think it was Mark 6 or 7, he had this same thing where he told them that he would die and that he would raise again, right? And Peter, 
bold Peter, pulls Jesus inside and goes, you do not say that again, Jesus, right? Like Peter has the ability to say that. And what does Jesus respond to Peter? Get behind me, Satan, right? You don't understand. You don't fully comprehend. It happens again here, and we'll see it happen again in Mark 10. This is a recurring theme that Jesus is trying to get his disciples to understand the fate that he would face. It wasn't the one that they expected. It wasn't the one that they were taught growing up from their Jewish background. But it was the one that would come true, that would happen. And Jesus was trying to get these disciples to understand this. And they did not understand it, but they were afraid to ask him. And and to be honest, I probably would be afraid too if I was there and I saw the, the conversation happen between Peter and Jesus, right? I can't speak. I can't really ask a question because if I do, he may say, hey, get behind me. Satan, right? I don't want to be called Satan, so let's just not ask the question and let's avoid that scenario completely, right? So they're afraid. They don't fully comprehend. They don't understand. And Jesus continues to tell them this and prepare them for this and help them to know that this will take place. But Jesus doesn't say that he will stay dead, right? He continues on. He says he will rise again three days later. And for you and I, We have the beauty of being on the other side of history, right? The disciples were living it day by day by day. They were seeing Jesus teach and heal and perform these miracles, but they had no idea what was coming. Whereas you and I, we have the glorious opportunity to look back on history and to know what Jesus is going to. But we don't have to wonder and wait for those three days if he's going to get out of that grave, right? We celebrate Easter every single year because we know that he rose from the dead. And because of that, you and I can rise from our spiritual death to walk in the newness of life that is in Christ Jesus. That we could be made free, that we could be made new. right? And we hear this all the time. And brothers and sisters, and I'm talking to myself here May we not grow tired of hearing about Jesus' fate. May we not grow tired or think that it is too simple or simply it becomes words that ring in our ear, but it's a truth that fails to hit our hearts because we are so familiar with it. Jesus' fate was just as powerful on that day that he died and that he arose and ascended into heaven. It's just as powerful today as it was then. And we need to constantly be reminded of it. Why? Why do we need to understand Jesus' faith? Right? We know what happened, but what's the importance? The importance is that you and I would be reminded that it's not about us. That we did nothing to atone our sin. That we did nothing to become made new. We did nothing to be set free. It was all through Jesus. His death, his burial, and his resurrection. But not only that, it would also remind us of the need, which is why we recite the Great Commission every Sunday, to go and share about this faith. You don't say anything because you know they know. Whatever happened, you know they know. Even if you're like, how do they know? You know they know, right? And that's, that's Jesus in this scenario. We don't know if it was because they were walking on the road and maybe the disciples got real heated and loud and Jesus overheard it. Or we know Jesus is the Son of God. He just knows everything. So maybe he just was aware and understood and knew what took place. But they don't say anything. Right? But Mark tells us, For on the way they had discussed with one another which one of them was the greatest. Right? Now here's one thing. Now to help understand this context, because I think if you're like me, sometimes we can jump to our context of how we understand, right? We live in DeSoto County, Mississippi, 21st century. Like our concept of how things work is a lot differently than it is for the first century Jewish person, which is who we're reading about here. So here's a commentator, and here's kind of how they put it to help us understand. That this kind of speech, this, this boasting about who was the greatest, was common in this time frame. Because they were in a hierarchical system where they had different castes and social statuses and you almost had to boast at some point to declare what status you were in or to prove that you belonged where you said that you belonged. But here's the truth is that Jesus did not come to reinforce the cultural norms of society but rather to highlight the structure of the kingdom of God. And even though we're not first century Jewish people and we don't have the exact same culture Does our culture not also highlight the need to do the most of what you can to make yourself the ruler of your kingdom and to do everything to advance yourself to the highest possible degree, 
right? You need to make this amount of money. You need to have this many kids. You need to have this brand of clothes. You need to have this nice of a car. You need to have a house that's this big and all this kind of stuff. And you got to have all this on social media. If you don't have more than this many followers, you're, you're kind of lame. Like, you need to step up your game, right? And that, that's our culture, and it becomes who is the best, who is the greatest, what do you have that's better than what so-and-so has. It's just a constant back and forth. When we try to prove ourselves as more worthy than we probably actually are because we get in this competing with the Joneses kind of mentality, right? And that's what these disciples, that's kind of what they're dealing with here. But what does Jesus do? He called the 12. Now this is kind of significant and this is something we may read over but if you look back over Jesus' teaching like a lot of times it just kind of happens with the disciples, right? Maybe they ask a question and he responds or maybe they're just there and they kind of overhear things but this is one like formal thing where he understands he asks this question, nobody answers but he knows they've been arguing. He says, "All right, y'all gather around we're having a family meeting. Like we're about to get real up in here. You're about to learn something, right? This is, this is the official call to like, you need to pay attention to what I'm about to say. And what does he say? If anyone wants to be the first, he shall be the last of all and servant of all. And taking a child, he set him before them. And taking him in his arms, he said, whoever receives one child like this in my name receives me. And whoever receives me does not receive me, but him who sent me. Now what Jesus says here is completely flipped of what these disciples would expect from someone to be the greatest, right? They're arguing about who's the greatest. Their advice uh, that Jesus gives here is not what they should think, right? If you want to be first, you need to be last. They're like, what? Hey, if you want to be first, if you want to be top dog, then you need, you need to be servant of all. Where in their minds, if you were the top dog, if you were the highest in society, then you're not a servant, right? You've got a bunch of servants to do whatever you want them to do. Like that's their idea is that I'm going to reach the top and I'm going to have these people to do everything that I need them to do and I don't have to do anything. And what Jesus says is completely contra- contradicting that statement. Because he says, hey, if you want to be top dog, you want to be number one, you serve everybody. You don't gather a bunch of servants to do the the different tasks that you may not want to do, like cleaning the toilet at the house or your laundry or whatever it may be. You become servant of everybody and everything. And if you want to be first, then you need to be last, which doesn't seem to make sense. But Jesus is trying to drive this point home here that's all about humility. It's not about status. It's not about being one of the 12. It's not about anything. It's about looking at yourself and being last and seeking to be humble. Now, we see that Jesus takes an opportunity here, being in the home, a a child is there. We don't know how old this child is, we don't know a lot of details, but Jesus takes this child and he uses him as an object lesson, right? If you receive one child like this in my name, uh, you receive me, and whoever receives me does not receive me, but the one who sent me, right? So to help put this in context about children, right, I have a little girl, she just turned one, had a birthday party yesterday, Phenomenal. I don't know if you've ever had that many small children in your house, but let me tell you, it's eventful, right? We had a ball pit, plastic balls flying everywhere. I think we're still going to find those a year from today, but that's going to be okay, right? That's part of it. Please tell me yes, or I will freak out, right? But anyway, when we picture children, right, some of these words, again, this is from a commentary to help us understand kind of the culture. We see children as innocent, vulnerable, gentle, even pure. Right? That's kind of some words that we would think of when we think of children, right? But in the first century culture, which is, again, the, the time frame that this writing is taking place, they were viewed as insignificant in having no social status. So where you and I, we see a little kid, and we're like, oh, she's so cute. Even if she's not, you still say it, right? We're in the South. We've got to be nice. In the first century time, it was just like, oh, we've got to wait on them to get older. They provide nothing for society. Like, what are they doing here? Like, let's just wait till they get older, till they can work, till they can bring some income in, till they can work in the fields and do their job and all that kind of stuff, right? Completely different mindset than you and I have. Now, this welcoming this little child is completely different here. Right? The idea is that as you have people in society who are seen as insignificant or who are seen as not bringing a lot to the table, much as the first century Jewish people would see a child, right? They don't have a lot to offer. They seem kind of insignificant. It just doesn't make a lot of sense, right? What does Jesus tell his disciples to do to people who fit this mold? It's to welcome them in, 
right, to bring them in, to welcome them in, to make sure that they are a part of what's going on. Again, completely contradicting what they would expect, right? I think a great picture that we see in Scripture, and not like as a, a, a good example for us to follow, but if you look at the Pharisees and the Sadducees and the different religious elite, I think you can see how this plays out in their culture, right? That they wanted the prominent places. They wanted to be with the prominent people. That they wanted all of these high and wealthy and mighty things. And that is not what Jesus asked of his disciples to do. It's not about raising yourself to this place of high esteem, but, but it's about humbling yourself to where you understand that it's not about you. Right? It's not about you. It's about welcoming people in to see the Savior, Jesus, that we need to exhibit this humility. Right? And that's a little different than we see uh, in Matthew where Jesus has this con- uh, conversation very similar. He says, if you would come to me like, like with childlike faith, right? we've all kind of heard that, which that kind of puts us in this place where we understand that we are insignificant and vulnerable and we come to Jesus. But here in Mark, I want you to note the distinction that whoever receives one child like this in my name, that the disciples are the ones receiving those that society may say are insignificant or not worth it or don't bring a lot to the table. Right? Those are the ones we are to welcome into the fold, to the family of God. We are not to push them out to say, you don't have a place here. You don't fit the mold. You don't bring a lot to the table. No, no, no. We are all supposed to say, none of us bring a lot to the table. Come and join us, right? Because we're here at the king's table and nobody brought anything. So come and join. That's what he's trying to get these disciples to understand, to see, to welcome the insignificant and to not push them away, much like the religious elite did as we see throughout the Old New Testament. Now, continuing this kind of thing, right, we see this other scenario that takes place in the realm of this humility. This is John speaking. He said to him, teacher, we saw someone casting out demons in your name, and we tried to hinder him because he was not following us. But Jesus said, do not hinder him, for there is no one who will perform a miracle in my name and be able soon afterward to speak evil of me. For he who is not against us is for us. And for whoever gives you a cup of water to drink in my name because you are of Christ, truly I say to you, he will not lose his reward. So John, again, if you know John, right, John and his brother James, they're, when you read about them, they're kind of the ones at the forefront of we are the greatest, right? Their mom has a conversation with Jesus, another account of like, hey, can my boy sit at your right and your left hand? They have this other one where they want to call down fire on this Samaritan village. Like these dudes are amped up. They're ready to go, right? They're very bold, and they just kind of, I think, Or like Peter in a sense that they just say stuff before they think about it. And then Jesus really just gives it to them, right? Hits them with the truth and they hurt a little bit. But they don't learn their lesson much like us today. Right? So he says, hey, look, we saw this guy casting out demons in your name. Remember what just kind of took place earlier in chapter 9 was the other nine disciples could not cast out a demon in Jesus' name. You know what I'm saying? You see how Mark kind of puts these two together? Anyway, I thought that was cool. He cast them out and we tried to hinder him because he was not following us. Right, so this dude, follower of Jesus, obviously, in Jesus' name, cast out a demon. And what does John do? Stop it, right? I just picture John running up to this guy like, stop it. What are you doing? Who do you think you are? And his whole premise is, hey, you're not one of us. You're not one of the 12. You're not elite. You're not, you haven't been here. You don't know what's going on. Like, what are you doing? You're not one of us. And so now he comes to Jesus like, be proud of me, Jesus. Listen to what I did. What does Jesus say? Do not hinder him. Like, what are you doing? You missed the point. This man is out here casting demons in my name, and obviously it's happening, which means that he had genuine trust and faith in Jesus, right? If you go to Acts 19, just a little rabbit I want to chase real quick. Acts 19, the same things happen, but it's Jewish people who are just using in Jesus' name as like a a magic potion serum to cast out, right? They're like, if we just tack this on to the end of our exorcism, then it'll, it'll happen, right? So they're trying it and it doesn't work, and they get chastised, and it's not good, okay? So obviously this dude is a real believer, okay? Obviously this dude really knows Jesus if he's doing this, and it's happening, right? So Jesus says, hey, look, if he does this, he's not going to be able to speak evil very soon after. Like if this dude genuinely has enough faith in me to confront a demon and say, hey, hop up out of this guy, and the demon listens, then like he probably really knows me. Right, So we don't, don't freak out John that he's not part of the 12 because he actually knows me and trusts me. So like, let him do his thing. Like, I'm going to use other people than you 12 to do great things. Okay, I, I feel like that's kind of what Jesus is wanting John to understand in this moment. And then he hits us with this. 
For he who is not against us is for us. Right? For he who is not against us is for us. Now, personally, I think this is one of those that is really hard for you and I to comprehend again because we can get sucked into this idea that once we are a part of the greatest denomination or the greatest church or the greatest religious organization, whatever it may be, that we think if nobody's a part of that, then they are all the enemy, right? If you are not a part of this special group that I'm a part of and you don't carry a card and you don't wave it around, then like, you are the enemy, right? But what Jesus is trying to say is like, hey, look, there's going to be other people who may not necessarily be one of the 12, but they really know me, they know who I am, they know that I'm the Messiah, and they have genuine faith in me, and they're doing good kingdom work. Like, they are not against you, they are for you. They are helping advance the kingdom. They are helping proclaim the gospel. They are helping to move the kingdom forward. Now, for today, are there groups out there who say they are doing things in Jesus' name, and their theology of Jesus is completely wrong and inaccurate? Absolutely so. So do we overlook them in the name of what they're doing in Jesus' name? Absolutely not. We hold them high to the standard that they must know and understand and comprehend that Jesus was the Son of God, that he died a real death on a cross, but that he rose a real resurrection so that we could be made new. That Jesus is the one, the only Son of God, and he's the only way to heaven. And if people get off base on that kind of stuff, then yeah, they are against us because they're not proclaiming the true gospel. But if they hit that home and maybe they do things a little bit differently than you and I do in here, but they really know who Jesus is and they really love him and they're doing stuff out there, they're not our enemy. They're not the one we're looking to fight. The one we're looking to fight are those proclaiming a false gospel or the ones out there who are trying to persuade people away from the church. Right, so may we not miss that. May we not get caught up in fights that we don't need to fight because we have identified the wrong enemy. For he who is not against us is for us. Right? And Jesus continues to highlight the humility that he wants. He paints this picture in verse 41 of someone just simply giving a cup of water in Jesus' name to the disciples as they go out and travel. And much first century, much like here in the south, like they're just very hospitable. That's a very like normal thing for them to do. Like They're walking through towns looking for people to tell the good news to. It's probably hot. They're dirty. Like, hey, you want a cup of water? Like, even if it's as simple as that, Jesus is commending them for that. Like, even in the small things that we don't think matter, Jesus is trying to say, like, that's a huge deal. Right, what does he say after that in verse 41? He will not lose his reward. Like, do the small things and do them well in humility because Christ had called us to. That's what we see here in this bulk of these verses, that Christ calls his believers to humility, not to run towards this place of prominence, not to gather all the authority and prestige and this power that we can, but to come to the Savior who has all power and all authority and all prestige in humility because we have none of that. That is what Christ has called us to. And as we've called to uh, look at this word humility and we've called to understand that humility is key to living a life as a believer, as a disciple, there's one way that I've heard it described humility, and I want to leave you with this before we move on to the next thing, just to kind of help it stick in your brain a little bit. Humility is not thinking of yourself less. It's thinking of your, wait, I'm sorry, I messed that up. It's not thinking less of yourself, but thinking of yourself less. Does that make sense? Sorry, I started that backwards. You see, we're all here together, okay? Yeah, not thinking less of yourself, but thinking of yourself less, right? It's not all about Ryan. I'm not the number one star in the movie of my life. God is, right? And the work that Jesus has done in my life is the main theme, not whatever little things that happen in my life. That's humility. That's what it is. Not to beat ourselves up, but not to make ourselves the king of the castle because we got the king of all kings who should be in that place on the castle, right? But it doesn't stop with humility, The last bit of chapter 9 points us to that we need to understand the severity of sin. We have to understand the severity of sin. Pick up with me in verse 42. And whoever causes one of these little ones who believe to stumble, it would be better for him if a heavy millstone were hung around his neck and he had been cast into the sea. And if your hand causes you to stumble, cut it off. 
It is better for you to enter life crippled than having your two hands to go into hell into the unquenchable fire. And if your foot causes you to stumble, cut it off. It is better for you to enter life lame than having your two feet to be cast into hell. And if your eyes cause you to stumble, gouge it out. For it is better for you to enter the kingdom of God with one eye than having two eyes to be cast into hell, where their worm does not die and their fire is not quenched. For everyone will be salted with fire. Salt is good, but if the salt becomes unsalty, with what will you make it salty again? Have salt in yourselves and be at peace with one another. Man, that's heavy, right? We understand the seriousness of sin. And I don't think necessarily that we mean to do this, but this is something that I've just experienced in my own life when I came to a brother or a sister in Christ and said, hey, look, I'm struggling with this. I've got this issue going on. I really messed up here. And the words that I got, while they meant well, I think missed the mark. And they said, it's okay, Ryan. Everybody does that. It's okay. And it's like, it's really not okay that I did that. It's really not okay that I had that happen. Now, do I need to be comforted? Like, hey, like there is grace for that? Absolutely. But we should not just have every sin to where it becomes the, the normalcy, right? Because then we miss the severity of sin. If our brothers and sisters come to us and they confess a sin, do we need to be loving? Absolutely. But do we need to, to help them understand the seriousness of what they committed? Absolutely, right? Jesus does not use kind, soft language here in these verses, right? Look at the very first thing. He goes back to the child, back a couple of verses, right? This insignificant believer. He says, hey, if you cause one of these children to stumble, if you cause them to fall short, if you put a sin in their way, or if you add extra weight onto them, and you cause him to miss the gospel and to fall away from me, it's better to put a big old millstone, which is this huge stone that is hundreds upon thousands of pounds that big animals would churn to break grain down, to use different things. It's better to wear one of those as a necklace and to jump into the ocean. The picture he's painting is that dude ain't coming back up from the ocean, right? How serious, how severe is that? That causing one of these insignificant believers to sin or to walk away from God leads to a dude wearing a big rock around his neck and jumping into the ocean. You and I are like, holy, did Jesus really say that? Yes, Jesus really said that. And I think if you're feeling what I'm feeling right now, like that's the point. Jesus wants us to understand how severe sin is, that we don't need to bring anyone any like close to it. I think sometimes our concept, and I know I've been here, again, this is all from experience, not cast anything. This is just like Ryan showing you what I've learned in my short life. So often, I would think, how close can I get to sin until it's sin? You know what I'm saying? Like, how close can I wander over here until I cross the line that is sin? When in reality, as we see here, that's not the mindset we need. The mindset we need is like, if sin is anywhere over there, I'm high-tailing it down Goodman Road as fast to Olive Branch as I can. Right, We are running and we are getting away from it. Look at the next picture that he paints as he goes and he says, hey, look, did your hand cause you to stumble? Chop it off. What about your foot? Get rid of it. You got two left feet when you dance anyway. Just go ahead. Cut it off. You're good. Right? What about your eyeball? Just pluck that dude out. Throw it. Throw it away. Get rid of it. You don't need it. Right? Was Jesus asking us to really like go and cut limbs off of our body? I don't think so. Again, I think the picture Jesus is trying to paint is to help his disciples and you and I to understand the seriousness that is sin. Instead of seeing how close we can get, we need to run. Even if it means we're chopping off a part of the body to get that away from us, right? Whatever it is in our life that leads us to sin, that draws us away from God, that leads us into disobeying his laws, that leads us into running away from his good command, that draws us into disobedience instead of humble obedience, that we get rid of that in our lives. Practically speaking, I wish I could say that that was a really easy thing to do. From the stage, I really wish I could say, like, hey, if you come down front in the response time, you say, hey, God, figuratively, please chop off my hand or my foot or my eye or whatever's causing me to sin, that it would just be like, you get it from the altar, you're magically healed, and you go and sin no more. But we live in this thing called flesh, and it's really hard. And it's a battle that we face each and every day. But may we not forget the severity of sin. 
May we not just think it's something that we do and it's just something we deal with. May we understand that Jesus paid the price for sin, not for his believers to continue to run back to it, but to flee from it and to pursue a life of holiness and purity because he is the most holy and most pure one there ever was and there ever will be. May we understand the severity of sin and run from it. Now, I want you to hone in on this prophecy or this pullback from the Old Testament, verse 48. It says, where their worm does not die and their fire is not quenched. Now, just to really bore you real quick with some Greek, I hope this doesn't bore you. I found this really fascinating, right? This Greek word is, points back to this place called the Valley of Hinnom. Hinnom, Hinnom, it's like cinnamon but different, okay? Anyway, so in the Old Testament, there was this place, this Valley of Hinnom, where these different pagan people, they would have human sacrifices here in this valley. Like that was a part of their pagan religion that they would sacrifice children or whoever it was in this valley, right? That's a horrible place. Now fast forward throughout the history, there was a king that came to be and it was banned uh, that this would happen. And so they turned this place where there used to be human sacrifices into a garbage jump, essentially, right? So all of the area would take whatever they were getting rid of and they would just throw it into this big valley where it would just burn forever, right? So just picture that real quick. This is a place where they used to do human sacrifices. Now it's a garbage dump that is on fire with worms calling around it. I don't know about you, but that's not a place that I want to go. Not only is that a place I don't want to go, that's a place I don't want to get close to. Like it does not sound good or honorable or anything like that. And when Jesus said that, he points back to the Old Testament and these disciples who know it very well and who grew up in that culture would understand what he was saying. That hell, this place defined like this, the worm does not die and the fire is not quenched. Like that is not a place where they want to go. That is not a place they want to be a part of. So may they treat sin seriously. And may you and I treat sin seriously. Because we understand Jesus did. And he died for it. That we could be freed from it. And that we could run to him and not have to pay that price. Because he sent his son to do that on our behalf. The last two verses I want to unpack real quick. Uh, I don't know, I want to say quick because that's subjective and we know I'm the quick preacher around here. So anyway, uh, verse 49, for everyone will be salted with fire. Now I just want to stop right here. This is a very interesting word order here in the New Testament. In fact, one of the commentators I said, this is the only place that this phrase, salted with fire, is used in the entire New Testament. Right, so it's very Interesting what Mark is doing here is he writes it in this way. Now, if you are like an Old Testament guru or wizard, in Leviticus 2.13, it paints back to this grain offering, where before they would offer this grain offering, they were to season it with salt and then give it to the priest, and the priest would offer it up in smoke. Right, so this idea that this offering would be salted and then given to the fire, Mark writes, for everyone will be salted with fire. In light of understanding the severity of sin, we contrast that with instead of running a life of sin and doing what we want to do, we are to be sacrifices to God, right? We are to be living sacrifices, as the book of Romans would put it, that we offer our lives. We are seasoned with fire, not like that does not sound good either, right? Can you just imagine being seasoned with fire, salted with fire? Like, I don't want that. But in this sense, what Mark is trying to get the believers to see is that it means you are being prepared as a sacrifice, that your life is no longer yours, right? Whenever they gave up this grain offering to the priest, it was not like, hey, I'm going to give you this grain, and then, like, I still need some to make some bread when I get back home. Like, that's not what happens. Like, you give it to the priest, and the priest takes it and offers it up in the same way we are that sacrifice. It's no longer, what do I want to do with my life? It's, God, how do I honor you in my life? That my life is yours. Right, here I am, take me, use me as you need me. I'm no longer the one orchestrating things or calling the shots like you are, God. I'm a sacrifice, use me as you need me. That's the picture here of being salted with fire. In verse 50, salt is good, but if the salt becomes unsalty, what, how are you going to make it salty again? Have salt in yourselves and be at peace with one another. Now another thing with salt is this idea that it preserves 
right? In, in this time frame, they didn't have refrigerators. They didn't have all that kind of stuff. So when they had meat and different things, like they had to salt it in order to preserve it to make it last as long as it possibly could, right? And so what Jesus is saying is, hey, hey your job as disciples is to be that salt, to preserve the good, to go out and to help people understand what the good news is. Like preserve that gospel, keep it, and share it, right? And what does that lead to? It leads to being at peace with one another. Again, we're not fighting against one another because we understand that a lot of us are on the same team. For if you are not against us, you are, that was your chance. Some of you did really well, some of you not so good, okay? If you're not against us, you are, there you go, more, I like it. You are for us. I'm just trying to make sure you're still awake, okay? You're for us. We work together. We have peace with one another when we humble ourselves, when we understand the severity of sin, and when we understand that our job is to be sacrifices, living for the king, that all of that leads to being salt and to being at peace with one another in this world. So today, I hope you've understood what it means to be a disciple, that you live in humility, you're reminded of Jesus' fate, and we never forget that and what that means for us, that we could be made new. And that you understand the severity of sin. And this morning, if you've never understood that before, I pray this may be the morning that you come and you have a conversation with somebody. Or you just pray to God and tell him, like, God, I understand that I've been running and doing what I want to do. Help me to humble myself before you. Or maybe this morning you're someone in here and you say, like, hey, I know who Jesus is and I follow him. But there's some sin in my life and I really need to deal with it. Well, I'll offer you figuratively to come cut that off this morning. Whether it's talking with somebody you know and trust, if it's coming to the altar, or whatever it may be, to ask God to help you run, to flee from that which entangles you and which ensnares you. Would you ask him to do that this morning? And maybe this morning you say, hey, I know Jesus, I'm still struggling, but but there's some work I need to do in preserving and being a part of the kingdom work, whether that's as a volunteer here somewhere in the church or whether that's going vocational with what you do. I pray that you would respond as the Lord leads you. As Blake and the team come forward, I pray that you would just humble yourselves before God and ask him what you need to do in this time as we give you a time to sing a song, to pray, to come forward, to come to somebody who's standing in the front, whatever it may be, however you may need to respond. And before we pray, I found this quote as I was studying from Juan Carlos Ortiz, and he says this, Discipleship is more than getting to know what the teacher knows, it's getting to be what he is. May we seek to look more like Jesus. Would you pray with me? Father, thank you so much for the love that you have for us. Father, I'm so grateful that you sent your son to die a death in our place that we could be made new and that we could be forgiven. God, may we never forget that. And Father, I pray that in our striving so often we miss the point and the call to be humble. God, I pray you would help humble us and help us to think less of, our, of who we are, God, to help us think of ourselves less and think of you more. And Father, as we are surrounded with sin so often, may we never grow numb to it. God, may we understand how severe it is and how much you dislike it, that you would send your son to pay the price for it. Father, I pray you be with those as they need to respond in this time, whatever that may be. Father, we pray this all in Jesus' name.